Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Katherine Seltner in our Washington, D.C. studio. It is truly good to have you here with us. The U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives are both out on recess this week, but calls for action on health care reform have not slowed down. Pro-life leaders continue to demand two important pro-life protections remain in place in U.S. health care reform. First, taxpayers must be protected from funding abortion. And second, Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion provider, must be defunded. Joining me now is Marilyn Musgrave, a former U.S. representative from the state of Colorado and the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List. Congresswoman, it's good to have you here. Good to be here. Before we delve into our discussion, I'd like to look at an interview I recently did with Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina. We discussed health care reform and more. Let's take a look at that now. Why, as a pro-life senator, is health care reform important to you? Well, health care reform is important because we've made a promise to the American people that the federal and state governments could provide a safety net. And now that safety net's being threatened. If we don't make changes in our health care policies a few years down the road, I think we're going to have a significant crisis in terms of providers leaving the marketplace and insurance companies providing policies that are simply unaffordable. That creates a real safety net problem that, uh, that worries me. It's one of the most important things I think we have to focus on in this Congress. Senator, 11-month-old baby Charlie Gard recently died in London after being denied experimental treatment. That went against his parents' wishes. How alarming is this case to you, Senator, and could we see an incident like Charlie Gard's in our current U.S. health care system? Well, I think it's very sad, and we have to avoid it. If you, if, you think, if you think about Charlie, he was one of those vulnerable people that needs our help. And I hope as a matter of policy or as a matter of practice in, in the United States, we would never see that sort of situation that the parents are confronted with and would do everything I could to support policies to avoid that. How much, Senator, of a priority are the pro-life protections in our health care to you. Would you vote for a plan that didn't both A, prevent the taxpayer funding of abortion and B, defund Planned Parenthood? Well, I think that uh, any of our policies here that deal with appropriation should always have hide protections. We should not be providing taxpayer funding of abortions. On the uh, on Planned Parenthood, as Speaker of the House, I uh, supported measures to defund Planned Parenthood in the state. I think that we need to make sure that we communicate to the American people that that's not defunding women's health. It's actually putting that money equivalent and sometimes more sums of money in community health clinics that provide uh, mammography and all the kinds of things that uh, women's health clinics can provide. We've got to do a better job of communicating to the American people what we're trying to do, which is to simply prevent taxpayer dollars being used to fund abortions. What advice might you have, Senator, for our viewers who want to communicate that message to their friends and neighbors at home? Well, I think one thing we have to do is lower the uh, temperature and just have a, a, a calm, um, respectful discussion about the value of life. We did that in North Carolina, and over the course of a few years that I was Speaker, we were able to get bipartisan support for pro-life bills that have dramatically reduced the number of abortions in North Carolina, but it starts with the tone. And it starts with just communicating, um, and, and I think in a way that everyone can understand and can talk with their families, talk with people in their communities, so that we make this less polarizing than it really should be. Senator, you are Catholic. Does your Catholic faith influence your pro-life views, and if so, how? Well, it does. You know, I grew up in a family of six kids. I've been a Catholic all my life. I've got a, a big uh, now family of nieces and nephews, and. Um, and we've had some very difficult uh, circumstances. I have a niece who's uh, had suffered a profound uh, illness uh, from the point that she was born. Uh, she's been on a feeding tube all of her life. And, um, but she's really brought joy to our family and joy to her parents. And I think that, uh, you know, it's just being raised in that sort of culture. Um, it's just a part of who I am and it's a part of who I'll always be. Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina, thank you for your time. Thank you. Congresswoman, based on what Senator Tom Tillis was saying, how come we couldn't get pro-life Democrats to vote in favor of the Senate bill? Do we have well, pro-life Democrats? Well, there are, are Democrats that have voted for pro-life bills, but of course this 
Obamacare and repealing and replacing that, you know, they, they in-group oppose doing away with that. Mm -hmm. But the thing about Tillis that really struck me, when the mm -hmm. senator was speaking, we helped elect him. You know, he talked about how when he was Speaker of the House in North Carolina, he worked to defund Planned Parenthood and sign into law pro-life legislation. Uh, we worked very hard to elect him, and I'm so glad his pro-life voice is there in the Senate. And we especially needed it as they were doing health care, because Susan B. Anthony List all along on the House side and the Senate side have said, no taxpayer funding of abortion and redirect those Planned Parenthood dollars to community health care centers that can really give women comprehensive health care and don't do abortions, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so Tillis spoke, you know, from the heart, uh, a, a man that we helped elect. I mean, you can see how great he is in the Senate. It seems he was very passionate about this. Yes. Right now we're seeing an open public debate amongst the Democratic Party on whether or not they would be open to electing pro-life candidates. How significant is this? Well, it's very significant to me because they are noticing that they have a problem with registered Democrats around this country who 30% self-identify as pro-life. Mm -hmm. And the party has left them. But I have to tell you, I'm very skeptical. Okay. I'm a former state legislator in Colorado where you know I was told that this pro-life Democrat, Bill Ritter, that was running for governor, mm -hmm. was told by the archbishop of our state mm -hmm. that he was the real deal. The first thing Bill Ritter did, and like Kane, who ran as a vice presidential candidate, had been a Catholic missionary, mm -hmm. the first thing he did was to restore funding to Planned Parenthood, uh, you know, that provides abortions in Colorado. Mm -hmm. After we in the legislature and Jane Norton as lieutenant governor had worked very hard to make sure no taxpayer dollars were going for abortion in Colorado. When I came to Congress, there were Democrats that would vote pro-life on occasion. But where are the Chris Smiths? Where are the Trent Franks? Where are the Diane Blacks? Mm. You know, the pro-life Democrats that will do more than just give you a vote on occasion, that will really champion life. And I tell you, when you are really pro-life, it's high up on your list of priorities. For many of us, it was the highest priority because we know that's the most vulnerable human being there is. And if you go to Congress to help veterans and to help people with uh, problems with the government, with private property rights, many ranchers lived in my district. I mean, you have to be aware that the most vulnerable human being is that unborn child. And if you're going to have that, you know, in your heart, you, you have to work for it. You have to break a sweat for it. You have to make sacrifices for it. And we need pro-life Democrats. We need them so badly. We need them to pass unborn child pain capable. There will be a vote this fall in the House and hopefully in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I hope that Democrats uh, will vote to ban late-term abortion. And I hope the party will find room for pro-life Democrats. But let me tell you, if you're elected as a pro-life Democrat, mm -hmm. I saw this when I was in Congress, mm -hmm. and you immediately vote for Nancy Pelosi as Speaker then, you're not going to do anything pro-life because they're going to tramp that down. It's not going to happen. So let's be real about this. If you're going to have real pro-life Democrats that can act on their beliefs while they're legislators. Constituents will be watching. We will be watching. Marilyn Musgrave of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you so much for your insight on this. Great to be here. The latest effort to defund Planned Parenthood in the health care bill is stalled. But with each day that passes, Planned Parenthood aborts nearly 900 unborn children and receives $1.5 million in taxpayer funds. Members of Congress are home in their districts and need to hear from their constituents right now. With that, here is this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell Congress to defund Planned Parenthood. We are making it very simple for you to take action and make your pro-life voice heard. Once you go to ProLifeWeekly.com, you'll type in your first name, your last name, email address, and zip code. This will ensure your message goes to your member of Congress. Just because Congress is on recess doesn't mean they get a break. So if you haven't done so already, please take action now. It's important we keep this pressure up. Pro-lifers have control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, so there's no excuse. Now is the time to defund Planned Parenthood, especially as they continue to perform abortions each and every day. 
tell Congress to defund the abortion giant by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Scientists report the first successful repair of a disease-causing gene, and Catholic ethicists are raising concerns. By utilizing in vitro fertilization techniques, doctors at Oregon Health and Science University injected the best gene components into a healthy donor's unfertilized eggs, later fertilizing it with donor's sperm, resulting in mutation-free embryos. All of the embryonic humans created and tested in the experiment were destroyed within a few days of the procedure. The Catholic Church stresses all human life, including those in an embryonic state, have an invaluable human dignity. We asked an international Catholic expert on bioethics, Carter Sneed, for his thoughts. There are grave concerns and, and perils associated with this as well. And what we've seen this new report that in the United States they've now actually not just intervened in a human embryo to change its, his or her genome, because as you all know, embryos are male and female from conception, uh, but in fact, embryos were created solely for the sake to be used and destroyed uh, in this research. And that is obviously a, a grave injustice to create a human being at the earliest stage of development to use and instrumentalize for speculative scientific purposes. It's an alarming indication euthanasia is on the rise. A recent study finds 4.5% of deaths in the Netherlands are a result of euthanasia. In 2002, the Netherlands became the first country in the world to legalize euthanasia, which is the deliberate killing of someone by action or omission. The percentage of euthanasia deaths in the Dutch nation have continued to increase since 1990, when it accounted for 1.7% of deaths. Discouraging pro-life news out of Chile, the Latin American country has officially approved a bill to permit abortion in certain circumstances. The measure, approved last week, would allow abortions when a woman's life is in danger, when a preborn baby is not considered viable, and in cases of rape. This bill is backed by President Michelle Bachelet herself, a physician and former head of UN Women, who said it will be signed into law. Although for this to happen, the bill still needs to pass through the country's constitutional tribunal. Currently, any woman who has an abortion and any medical personnel involved in the procedure are subject to up to five years in jail. More than half of women seeking abortions in Britain last year were using at least one form of contraception. The statistics were based on over 60,000 women who had abortions at clinics operated by the British Pregnancy Advisory Services, the country's largest abortion provider. The BPAS report notes 51.2% of women who saw abortions in 2016 were using at least one form of contraception. A quarter of these women were using methods considered to be the, quote, most effective forms, such as hormonal birth control pills and IUDs. A new report debunks Planned Parenthood's claim they are both irreplaceable and life-saving. Planned Parenthood is the dominant provider of induced abortions in the U.S. And according to a recent report from the Charlotte Lozier Institute, Planned Parenthood has a 35% share of the U.S. abortion market. Let's compare that to the other services they offer. Planned Parenthood has less than 1.4% of the nation's HIV tests and less than 1% of pap tests. To help us break down these numbers, we are joined by the report's co-author and president of the Charlotte Lozier Institute, Chuck Donovan. Chuck, it's good to have you here. Pleasure to be with you, Catherine. Let's talk Business 101. What is a market share and how significant is this? Well, market share is pretty much the definition of what a com company focuses on. So you would look at a supermarket chain. Uh, well, what share of the market do they hold? Are they big or are they small? Okay. They're the industry leaders. There are others who are quite small and local. So can you compare how Planned Parenthood stacks up to abortion compared to other more recognizable U.S. brands? Well, yes, this is the first thing that our report looked at, especially since Planned Parenthood claims that abortion is only 3% of their mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. But if you look at other industry leaders, take Southwest Airlines, the biggest airline in the United States. Right. They have 19.1% of the U.S. market for air travel. Look at General Motors, which is considered the lion of the auto industry. They have 17.3% of the U.S. automobile market. Turn to Planned Parenthood. They say their numbers are small. They actually do 35% plus of U.S. abortions. That's the entire United States. So they have twice the share of these big companies. Those companies that we recognize for the work that they As do. As the lions of their industry, Planned Parenthood is a mega lion in theirs. 
and they are the Megaline, the dominant abortion provider in the United States. But what about their other services, the services they often tout as irreplaceable and life-saving? Well, many of them, they, they are quite small. And of course, the issue in the Congress now is whether Congress should redirect funding to other agencies uh, that can pick up the slack. But for uh, pap tests, an important test for women to have, uh, they're under 1% of the U.S. market. HIV testing, uh, very common in the United States given our sexual culture. Planned Parenthood is 1.4 percent of the market. So they're not a big player in other things. Mm -hmm. Where they are big, of course, is abortion and also in contraception. So I think this point is very important and needs to be made clear. No service at Planned Parenthood is irreplaceable. So why are they getting so much federal funding? Well, there's a lot of momentum behind Congress's decisions to change what Congress has all, always done for years. And I think what's happening here is that women getting some benefits out of having their own health care cards mm -hmm. under the Affordable Care Act and proposed replacements, they're going to other providers like community health centers mm -hmm. where they can get dental care, mental health services, services for any children they have. They can often get mammograms and things that Planned Parenthood just doesn't do right. because Planned Parenthood is a testing agency for these things. It does not treat, even for sexually transmitted diseases, it's mm. not a treatment service. Sir, just testing. They'll do testing, okay. which is valuable and important to get mm -hmm. in many contexts, mm -hmm. but the follow-up is going to be done elsewhere. And the real question comes back to what the woman sees. Right. And if the woman is compelled by her government's funding patterns to go to an abortion clinic to obtain just the initial test, it makes very little public health sense. So Congress is acting in the best interests of our nation's women, particularly poor women who, go, who are trapped in the Planned Parenthood system by denying them these alternatives that offer them the full array of things they really want. Why do you think this is important to share, these findings about the market share in abortion? Why release this report? Well, one thing that Planned Parenthood does extremely well with $30 million in political action funds just last year, uh, much more than that in terms of their government relations activity, they're magnificent lobbyists mm. and their advertising campaigns are among the best. Madison Avenue does a great job for them. But the truth is, uh, in most areas of public health, they are very expendable. Hmm. and replaceable. They're not on the front line and they're certainly not what we want to give women who are in need. And certainly not what we want to spend half a billion dollars on in our federal government. At least half a billion. It may be approaching 600 million at this point. This is really insightful and helpful information. Chuck Donovan of the Charlotte Leisure Institute, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. When we come back. It's one of the only cases in history that's been before the court three times, the Supreme Court. And we won that one unanimously. He's been pro-life from the sidewalks to inside the Supreme Court. We speak with Joe Scheidler, a trailblazer for the pro-life movement in the United States. Stay tuned as EWTN Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. For Edith, by nature, women were called to be spouses and mothers. And of course she didn't necessarily mean that that had to be uh, natural biological marriage and motherhood. It could be spiritual, spiritual marriage and motherhood. That is Dr. Catherine Pakalak of the Catholic University of America reflecting on St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, who is also known as St. Edith Stein. Stein frequently wrote about the vocation of women before dying at a Nazi concentration camp in 1942. Her feast day was August 9th, so we remember her in a special way this week. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner. In another example of the abortion industry and women's magazines working hand in hand, we are speaking out against a fluff piece article on Planned Parenthood featured in Glamour magazine. The women's magazine published an article last week called The Quiet Revolutionary Act of Working at Planned Parenthood. The feature follows along the everyday activities of several New York Planned Parenthood clinic workers, including a Catholic woman. The woman is a former Catholic youth minister and is quoted as saying, I feel like I serve here at the clinic. God has me here for a purpose. We are not speaking out to attack the individuals working inside Planned Parenthood. It is highly likely those workers have been deceived by the company's health care and women empowerment brand and genuinely believe they are doing a good service. The workers do not deserve an attack, but rather our prayers, prayers for a conversion of heart. But what we are speaking out against is the editorial irresponsibility and misleading information on the part of Glamour Magazine. 
They should not cite a Catholic woman's rationale for working in the industry without clearly providing what the Catholic Church actually teaches, that formal cooperation in an abortion is a grave offense. On top of that, not once in this feature does the article mention Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider. Glamour is perpetuating Planned Parenthood's narrative that they are the underdog hero fighting against pro-life bullies. This article is another attempt to normalize the abortion industry disguised as a pro-woman magazine. Let us pray for these Planned Parenthood clinic workers that they use their skills to promote life instead of pouring their talents into a company that destroys it. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action and go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell Congress to defund Planned Parenthood. The pro-life movement wouldn't be where it is today without the brave men and women who paved the way for us to speak up for life following the 1973 Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision. This week, we introduce you to Joe Scheidler. His friends lovingly call him a troublemaker. Others call him a racketeer, but he is certainly a pro-life pioneer. Nearly 90 years old now, Joseph Scheidler has lived a life full of unexpected turns. After years of discerning the priesthood as a young man and then the monastic life in a Benedictine monastery, Scheidler decided in the late 1950s he wasn't suited for a religious vocation and eventually married and had seven children with his wife of more than 50 years, Anne. My wife thinks that probably I needed that background mm -hmm. because it was all the way through mm -hmm. philosophy, theology, and um, I wanted to be a priest. I think maybe that was partly preparation for fighting the abortion battle. It was a decision at the U.S. Supreme Court that would put the then public relations professional on yet another unforeseen path when the Roe v. Wade opinion was released in 1973. What impact did that ruling have on you in your life? And I thought, we've abandoned a whole segment of our people, mm -hmm. human beings. Mm -hmm. They can be killed for any reason up to birth. And I thought, we'll just, this will destroy the country. Scheidler decided he needed to leave his PR career behind and work full-time in the pro-life movement. He and his wife founded the Pro-Life Action League, and Scheidler is credited with defining direct pro-life activism. How do you develop what would become pro-life activism? What did you think that would look like? We knew where the abortions were, and the first thing we did was go to the abortion clinics and try to talk to the women as they would come in. And so we called that sidewalk counseling, and then we started going out on the streets with the pictures. And is it true that you really thought by showing people the images of what an unborn baby looked like or what an abortion looked like would change their hearts and yeah. minds? We thought showing the pictures, people would understand this is killing. People would stop. And we had one time 22 women who were thinking of abortion or on their way to abortions decided against it mm -hmm. by seeing the pictures. Pro-Life Action League empowers people to take bold, direct action in their own communities, from sidewalk counseling to passing out pro-life leaflets to peacefully protesting outside Planned Parenthood events. But this type of pro-life activism stirred up opposition from the abortion movement. In 1986, the National Organization of Women and a network of abortion facilities sued the Pro-Life Action League for the alleged crime of conspiring to deprive women of abortion. Scheidler was charged with racketeering, or illegal business dealing. It's the namesake of his new memoir, Racketeer for Life. It didn't make any sense, so we went to the Supreme Court in 1993 and said, uh, can they do this? And the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that they could use the racketeer. It was a case that dragged on for over 20 years. Then, in 2006, Scheidler won a decisive victory when the case came back to the Supreme Court for the third time. Third time. So it's one of the only cases in history that's been before the court three times, the Supreme Court. And we won that one unanimously. Scheidler credits his faith for getting him through his career in the pro-life movement, saying he tries to go to daily mass and often prays the rosary. Well, it's everything. I, I think one of the greatest gifts next to life itself is being a Catholic. Religion is absolutely the essence of fighting this battle. As his 90th birthday nears, the once burly Scheidler is more frail now, but the impression he has made in the pro-life movement is giant. Still wearing his signature hat and beard, Scheidler offers this advice for the next generation of pro-lifers. 
do something pro-life every day. Mm. If it's a prayer, if it's going to a clinic, if it is a, a talking to another person about abortion, do something pro-life every day. If you want to buy Joe Scheidler's memoir, Racketeer for Life, you can order it from our EWTN religious catalog at EWTNRC.com. That's it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. You can reach us anytime at ProLifeWeekly at EWTN.com. It's always great to hear from you. And I look forward to seeing you here again next week. Life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.